gentlemen come forward here we'll take up our offering here this evening and I'm eager to get back uh, to conclude the uh, text from this morning in Genesis chapter 35 uh, really looking forward to the last part of what God has for us in that passage here this evening so we'll get there uh, but we'll take up this offering first as we take up the offering take out your hymn book all right if you have a song you want to sing I'm gonna take three I'll take three. Then you got to stop me. Three, then you got to stop me. But you'll look at it, okay? And then I'll ask you which song you might want to sing after we take up the offering here. Um, and uh, so let's pray for it here at this time. And, and Brother James Carr, will you please lead us in prayer?
334. 334 is where we're going to be at here. And the name of the song, if you guys up there want to try to find it, I don't think it's probably in there, but it's called Make Me a Blessing. I hadn't sung this one in years. How many of you ever sang this song, Make Me a Blessing? Same two that raised your hand earlier. No. <laughs> Some of these are real good old songs, and uh, we need to bring them back. Make Me a Blessing. All right. Uh, the verse I'm going to struggle with, but the chorus is what I really know. So let's try to sing it. What's the first note? Out. Here we go. Out in the highways and byways of life, many are weary and sad. Carry the sunshine where darkness is rife, making the sorrowing glad. Make me a blessing. Make me. It's good, and uh, so there you go. All right, brother Eric, what, what's one you want to do? Three fifty-six. We don't got to go far. What song is that? I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. Let's give this one a try. Three fifty-six in your hymn book. There. <clears throat> Here we go on the first. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, He kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for His own. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. I cannot. Miss Melody and Ashton that went up at the same time. You all want the same song. Well, that works out really good then, okay? 439? 439. Let's see what we got there on page. Count your blessings. I thought it was going to be my country tis of thee. But uh, count your blessings. That's a good one. Let's sing that one. Here we go. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one, count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one, count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Amen. All right, well, you can put your hymn books up. Let's take our Bibles out, and uh, we'll give our musicians a chance to come down and join us, too, and we're going to turn over to um, Genesis 35, back in Genesis 35, and we'll be getting over into Genesis chapter 36 as well, um, and the message tonight, uh, continuing uh, the message back to Bethel. We began to learn about uh, how God called Jacob back to Bethel in um, Genesis 35 this morning. And uh, as we said this morning, uh, when you make the decision to go back to Bethel uh, and to turn back the way the Lord is wanting you to go, uh, there's four experiences that you'll have along the way. And we saw, first of all, this morning that the, on the way back to Bethel was the route to revival. And uh, that, in that route, we saw that there was a calling 
um, that takes place. There was a cleansing that took place. Uh, there was a caretaking that is ensured along that way. And there is a comprehension that you'll come to that God is the one that you need. And uh, we saw those things this morning. And then uh, along that way back to Bethel, another experience you'll have, not only will you experience that it's the route to revival, but you'll experience the uh, reassurances of revival. And I love that point right there as God spoke to Jacob as we heard this morning and began to give, give him these assurances and he gave him as he gives to us when we turn to him the reassurance of our position in Christ uh, that we're accepted that we've been given a new name in spite of how we may have been living God still accepts us and that's a good thing right there. Then he gives, he gives the reassurance of his power and his promises. And I'm glad, even though we don't always keep our word to God, he always keeps his word to us. And I'm glad the God we serve is El Shaddai, the all-powerful God, who's able to take something like you and I and do something with us for his glory. I don't ever think we'll understand that. And so we saw, you'll experience these reassurances of revival. And then the last thing we noticed this morning is that along this way back to Bethel, you'll also experience the remembrance of revival. And we took some time at the Lord's table and we discovered that our Bethel, our monument that we go back to remind us of why we have the freedom to live the Christian life is the cross. And the cross, uh, that made all the difference in the world for you and I to be able to be saved from our sin and set free to live the Christian life. Now the fourth experience is what we're going to park on tonight. And so we only have one point. It has 75 uh, sub points, but we only have one point tonight. No, I'm just kidding. But I actually had an outline, but uh, the doggone printer would not print off the outlines for you guys tonight. And so uh, we'll just do it the old fashioned way uh, here this evening. What'd you say? <laughs> sure, sure. All right. Well, somebody have to pry it out of them later. But Genesis, the funny thing is, the rest of you probably heard them. I'm just deaf, so. Um, uh, there, there you go. But Genesis chapter 35, and the fourth experience we're going to look at as we turn back to the scriptures here this evening uh, is the results of revival. That's the fourth thing I want you to notice here this evening. We've seen the uh, route to revival, the reassurances of revival. We've seen the remembrance of revival. But I want you to notice tonight uh, in the rest of this text the results of revival. And I'm going to give several words of introduction before we get into this text here tonight. But I want you to think about this with me for a few moments this evening. After Jacob had experienced what he experienced at Bethel, after God came down and God met with him and his heart was, was moved and he had turned his life completely back over to the Lord, even got rid of some of the things that had taken him uh, a little bit farther away from the Lord, after this experience took place in Jacob's life, you and I would think that everything else from, from J in Jacob's life from that point forward would have been celestial bliss. I mean, he would, he would have had it made in the shade with lemonade, as they say. Uh, that's what we like to think. When Jacob came back to God, God made sure that the rest of his life was a bed of roses, that everything was great for Jacob. Like a lot of preachers preach today, it was all wealth and health and prosperity. Jacob was doing what God wanted him to do. And so obviously, God was just going to pour out all these blessings uh, that, that could not be contained in his life, right? Wrong. <laughs> Nowhere in the scripture does God promise if you follow me, it'll all be a bed of roses. To the contrary, 2 Timothy 3.12, this is what God does promise to those of us who will live godly lives, who will walk the way God wants us to go. It says, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's a promise. Well, boy, I don't think that's probably your life verse right there, Okay. But it's just as much a promise as whatever promise you may have claimed, can't claimed as your life verse. Jesus told us in John chapter number 16 and verse number 33, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And that's what Jesus has told us. In the world you're going to have tribulation, but you're also going to have me. And that's the reassurance we need. And here's the difference that happened in Jacob's life. 
from before he experiences revival to after he experiences revival. If we go back to chapter 34, which we won't do for sake of time tonight, we'll find that when Jacob had just experienced his daughter being raped and his sons massacring an entire village, how he responded was fear. Oh no, they're gonna, everybody else in this country are going to come and kill me and kill my family because of what's happened here. And he was responding in fear. But now, if he's experienced this revival with the Lord and God had transformed his heart, what we find is when this, these things began to happen, these difficulties began to come up in Jacob's life, instead of responding in fear, he persevered in faith. He didn't allow those circumstances, those trials of his life to shake him from his newfound standing of faith in the Lord. That is the difference. When you experience a revival in your life, that won't mean that it takes away all the problems. But what it means is that it gives you a new capacity to be able to endure the problems that life brings to you. And that's what true revival will do for every single one of us. Warren Wiersbe, he wrote this. He said, being a victorious Christian doesn't mean escaping the difficulties of life and enjoying only carefree days. Rather, it means walking with God by faith, knowing that He is with us and trusting Him to help us for our good and His glory, no matter what He permits to come our way. And it's indeed true. You know, if we understand what the New Testament teaches, it is actually through the trials of life that God brings us to full maturity as His children. It's how He helps us grow up. Uh, you're in Genesis 35. Keep a marker there, but I want you to go over to James chapter 1. I had all this written in notes for you, but I want to I make sure that you see this here in James chapter number 1. And so let's go over there to James chapter 1. And in James chapter number 1, the Bible tells us in verse number 2, if you're there, say amen. James 1 verse 2 the Bible says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse what? Oh, temptations. These trials, these difficulties of life. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting or lacking nothing. God wants to use the trying of your faith, the temptations that he allows you to go through in life to bring you to perfection, to bring you to maturity. That's how he helps you grow up. That's how he stretches your faith. That's how he helps you mature as a Christian. A man once said, a faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. Boy, until you put your faith in action, you never know how strong your faith really is. Until you really have to trust God with that health trial. Until you really have to trust God with that bill, you don't know how it's going to get paid. Those circumstances of life, though they be difficult, that help us to grow in our dependence upon the Lord. And so a mature Christian will not ask God, how can I get out of this situation? But a mature Christian will rather ask God, what do you want me to learn from this situation? That's a sign of maturity. An immature person, God, why are you letting me go through this? A mature person understands the purpose of the trials of life and will ask God, what do you want me to learn out of this? Some of us, we've had to go through the same trial several times because we still haven't learned that we need to start asking God, what do you want me to learn? Please let me learn, and I'm tired of going through this thing. And uh, some of us have to go through the ringer a couple times, and that was Jacob. Jacob had, uh, had gone through several of these circumstances before, but now that God had uh, tra- changed his heart, now that he experienced this revival, we see the way he handled the trials of life, the results of revival were evident in the ways that he handled the trials trials of life. And if you have truly turned your life over to the Lord, the way that you handle the trials that you face in your life will be different as well. And I want you to see there's three different types of trials that we see the results of revival made evident through in the life of Jacob. The first type of trial, if you want to take notes about this here, is this. First, there was the trials of sorrow. Trials of sorrow that Jacob went through in the aftermath of of the revival he experienced. If you go back to verse number 8 of chapter 35 in Genesis, we find that the first trial of sorrow Jacob faced was the loss of his mother's maid. 
um, would have been a nanny of sorts to him when he was a child. Verse 8 tells us about this. It says, But Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried beneath Bethel under an oak, and the name of it was called Alan Beckath. Now, don't ask me to say that again, okay? You probably know how to say it right. Um, but the name of it was called, and there you have it. You, you can try and work on it yourself there, okay? But the Bible, what the Bible's indicating to us here is this is the first trial of Jacob's faith that he faced after this time of revival in his life. And actually, this happened in the midst of God working in his heart. Verse number 8 is right in, right in between when God told Jacob to go to Bethel and when God actually spoke to Jacob when he got to Bethel. We studied all that this morning. But right in the middle of God doing this reviving work in his life, God allowed for one of the people who was the nearest and dearest, one of the most special people in Jacob's life to die. It was his mother's maid. No doubt in that Middle Eastern culture there, in that ancient culture, uh, in some ways, Jacob would have been even closer to Deborah than he had been to Rebekah, his own mother, because he spent a lot of time with Deborah. And uh, there's a lot of speculation on how Deborah came to live with Jacob. Some people think that when, uh, Re when Deborah's boss, when Rebekah passed away, she was free to leave that household of Isaac and to go find Jacob. And she wanted to go live with Jacob. And lo and behold, she found Jacob and, and uh, she uh, started living in Jacob's household. And no doubt she was the one that brought the, the heavy news to uh, Jacob that his, that his own mother had passed away, that mom that had sent him away to the land of Haran to save him from his brother killing him. Um, uh, Deborah had come and told him that his mom had passed away. And so if you can imagine this, Deborah had become a mother of sorts to Jacob. And he viewed Deborah in his heart like a mother. And, you know, I, I, I have not lost my mother. I can't imagine what that feels like. Some of you have lost your mother. And it's not easy. A mother is one of the nearest and dearest people that God blesses us with in this lifetime. A father teaches us a lot of things, but I think that a mother, above all other things, teaches us about the grace of God and the love of God. And this was a special person that Jacob lost at this point in time in his life. And the Bible says that he was so sorrowful at the passing of Deborah that he named the place where they buried her under an oak tree. He named it uh, Alan Beckath, it's a name that literally means the oak of weeping. And Jacob was deeply sorrowful at the passing of Deborah. This was a hard trial in his life. And at Bethel, at this point in his life, God began to gently sever some of these ties that Jacob had in his life that were holding him to this earth. He was separating Jacob's heart little by little to be a little more his own. That's what was happening in Jacob's life here in the aftermath of this revival that had happened in his life. And, you know, the, the fact is uh, all of us uh, have to go through situations like this in life. Uh, it's impossible to go through this life, but to at some point lose a mother, lose a father, lose someone who's very precious to you. And one, one of the things we find during these times of sorrow is that God makes himself known to us in a little bit of a closer way. And Jacob, in this time of sorrow, was being brought a little closer to the Lord. But this wasn't the only time of sorrow we see. First, he lost someone who was like a mother to him, but then he lost a wife. As we go on in chapter number 35, we find that he didn't just lose a wife, but he lost his most beloved wife. Uh, and we could put it this way, he lost his favorite wife. Uh, it's not advisable to have more than one wife, um, but we've already studied how that fiasco happened there, okay? And, uh, um, and so, but Jacob lost this wife he dearly loved, Rachel, the, the love of his life, his sweetheart. In verse number 16, the Bible says that they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath. And Rachel tra travailed, and she had hard labor. Verse 17, it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni. But his father called him, what? Benjamin, that's the name we know him by. 
And Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar upon her grave that is the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day. Now sometime, I don't know if it was years, if it was months, if it was weeks, sometime after God had done this reviving work in Jacob's heart, uh, Jacob made the decision that it was time to leave Bethel. I don't believe he left Bethel out of a, uh, out of a state of rebellion. He was a cattleman. And he, he had to keep his cattle moving to be able to have a, give them some fresh water and some fresh food to be able to eat. And they had to migrate. They had to move around. And so Jacob traveled not too far away from uh, where he was at there in Bethel to Ephrath, a place that we later, later know as Bethlehem. And so he came to Bethlehem, and that was where he's going to have his, his cattle grazed. But boy, they hadn't traveled. I think it was but 30 miles between, uh, uh, between Bethel and Bethlehem there. And the Bible tells us that Rachel began to have hard labor. And uh, the, the Bible goes so far to tell us that as she was delivering her second son into this world, that it cost her her life. Boy, I, I, I don't belittle the fact, and I don't think I'll ever understand it. My wife has reminded me a couple times this pregnancy of this fact right here too. You don't understand what this feels like. And she's right, I don't have a clue. Boy, it's always a sorrowful thing to hear about a mom who, ha who gives her life so that her child can live. And that's what happened here in Rachel's life. The Bible says that as she passed out of this world, she, with her dying breath, no doubt, named her son Benoni. It's a name that literally means the son of my sorrow. I don't think that Rachel did this despitefully. I don't think that she did this hatefully. I don't know a mother who could. I think this was the son of her sorrow because she was never going to get to see this son grow. And she was sorrowful. Boy, it is always sad. Uh, it's devastating. Every time I hear the news of a parent who dies in a car accident or something along those lines, how devastating that is. And Rachel calls him Benoni. And in this moment of sorrow, there's Jacob. No doubt he's, he's holding the lifeless body of, of his beloved wife in his hands and he, and he hears her name, their new, newborn son, Benoni, the son of my sorrow. And in that moment, Jacob could have caved in to depression. He could have caved in to despair. But instead, once again, we see him responding in faith and without hesitation, he said, no, his name's going to be Benjamin. That means the son of my right hand. Literally, I like what Matthew Henry, how Matthew Henry described this name. He said, this name meant he's the one that is very dear to me. He's set on my right hand for a blessing to be the support of my old age like the staff that helps me walk in my right hand. Instead of looking at this child as a curse that took his wife, his beloved wife from him, he said, no, this son is Benjamin. He's the son of my right hand. He's the son of a blessing. And though, though his life took away the life of my beloved wife, God has a reason for bringing this son into the world. And we see Jacob's perspective of faith demonstrated in immediately renaming his son, even as he was holding the body of his beloved, lifeless wife in his hand. And we see Jacob facing one of the most sorrowful moments of his life with faith at this time. He didn't use this as an opportunity to curse God, but he used it as an opportunity to bless the Lord. It, it, it really is, uh, 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 it really reminds us, I should say, of, of Job and the trial that he went through. In Job chapter 1, in verse number 21, where Job said, The Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's the same type of response that Jacob had here in renaming his son Benjamin and by the way, if you think about what happened here centuries later, in this same place, Ephrath, this same place where uh, this moment of sorrow took place, at this same place it became known as a place of joy, Bethlehem. Because there, an angel announced good tidings of great joy when Jesus came into this world. And you can mark this down, it's a great application. Jesus brings joy to the places of sorrow in our life. We would always look back at Ephrath as a place of sorrow. Well, Rachel died. There's her tomb. But now we look, look back at it as Bethlehem, the place where Jesus was born. 
And uh, that's a beautiful picture for us there. He can bring joy even in the midst of our, our sorrows. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning, the Bible tells us. And so Jacob, through all of this sorrow that has taken place, we see him facing it with faith. We see him facing it with courage because of this revival that God had put in his life. The way he handled the trials of life changed when God got a hold of his heart. And it should, that should be true of you and I as well. And I want you to look at verse number 20. In verse number 20, the Bible says, and who? Jacob. Now, sir, if you're in the habit of marking your Bible, I, I've circled that word Jacob, and I'll, I'll show you why in a minute. The Bible says, and Jacob set up a pillar upon her grave, and it's the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day. Verse 21, next paragraph, it says, and who? Israel journeyed. Listen, it was Jacob who buried Rachel but it was Israel who moved on. God took away one of the things that was the nearest and dearest things to his heart, his beloved wife. But in that moment of sorrow, God detached him from something else that was holding him to the things of this world and set him free a little bit more to, to pursue God's purposes for his life. And I love that application there. Because I'm not saying that for you to live for God, your spouse needs to die, okay? That's not what I'm saying. But for all of us, there might be seasons of trial that God puts us to through where he takes away something that's precious to us. But if we understand it with a heavenly and eternal perspective, God will never do that without reason. He always has a reason. And he might just be making you a little bit more into the person that he wants you to be. That might be the reason he's allowing you to go through the trial that you're going through today. And so every season of sorrow that you face in life, it draws you a little bit closer to the God who the Bible describes as the God of all comfort. I like 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and verse 3 and 4. It says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all what? Comfort who comforts us in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. I mentioned Miss Daisy May this morning. I'll mention her again here. In a recent conversation I had with Miss Daisy May, she was telling me about how much she's looking forward to going to heaven. She's 91 years old. I think she has a right to talk about heaven. Uh, she's earned it, she told me. But one of the things she really talked to me about was how much she misses her late husband, Lyman. How many of you, how many of you knew Lyman? Lyman Black, good man. And I didn't have near as much opportunity to get to know him as well as some of you did. But boy, she misses him. She's actually wrote a, a biography about him. Misses him so much. And I did a good job on it. But she's talking about how much she missed him. But then she turned to me and she said, you know, but you know, Pastor, since Lyman passed away, the Lord has become so much more sweet to me said, I never knew that I could become so much closer to the Lord. But when he's all you have, you get so much closer to him. And I heard her talking about how in the midst of losing her spouse, her beloved husband, how much closer it's brought her to the Lord. That's not something I understand by experience, but it's something that I mark down in my heart. And I'm telling you, those, the seasons of sorrow that God allows us to, he's got a reason for them. And a, a mature believer will respond to a season of sorrow with faith and courage like Jacob did here. And this is all a result of him turning his life over to the Lord. Because if he was acting like the old Jacob, he wouldn't have responded to these things in this way. But boy, God got a hold of his heart. And during the trials of sorrow, we see him responding with faith and courage. Now, there, weren't only, well, there weren't only trials of sorrow he went through. The next thing I want you to note down here uh, in your notes is that there were also trials of shame. Now, does, they passed out the notes to you. Is that what they did a moment, moment ago? All right. Well, I guess the Holy Spirit finally got a hold of that, uh, of that printer up there. Uh, it was Miss Sheila Sparks. That's who it was, okay? Uh, there you go. But uh, uh, at least you'll have some verses to follow along with us here on. Trials of sorrow were followed by trials of shame. Now, don't miss this. The second type of trial Jacob faced, it was entirely different from the first ones that we looked at already, but it was no less difficult to go through. In one sense, it was more difficult to go through. And here's what happened. Jacob's son committed an act that was sinful, and that brought shame to Jacob and his house. The Bible begins to tell us about it in verse 21. If you're there with me, say amen. 
The Bible says in verse 21 that Israel journeyed and spread his tent beyond the tower of Edar. And it came to pass when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. And Israel heard about it. Now the sons of Jacob were twelve. The sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon, and Levi, and Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. The sons of Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin. The sons of Bilhah, Rachel's handmaid, Dan, and Naphtali. The sons of Zilpah, Leah's handmaid, Gad, and Asher. These are the sons of Jacob, which were born to him in Padamaram. The Bible tells us here, beginning in verse 21, that, that Jacob once again moved his family. He moved his family to the place called the Tower of Edar. Now, I like, to, I like to study these locations. A lot of times we just skip over them in our mind. But this Tower of Edar, it was, it was a watchtower uh, that cattlemen would use, uh, and it, it provided them a convenient place to be able to watch over all of their cattle uh, to be able to keep them protected from, from thieves and from, uh, and from uh, wild animals that would try to come in and steal them. And so it was a st- strategic location for them to be able to take care of, of their cattle. And uh, there was no bad reason that Jacob had moved his, his household and all of his belongings and all of his cattle to this place. But it was in this unsuspecting place that a very undesirable thing took place. The Bible says that Jacob's oldest son committed an act of fornication with one of Jacob's wives. Now that's despicable. It's an abominable thing. In fact, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, and he told them about this very act. He said that such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. What he's saying there is even lawless people who don't even, who don't even live by any type of rule or sense of morality, they have more common sense than to do something like this. It was a despicable thing that took place that no doubt, as word began to go around, brought a lot of reproach and disdain, not just to Reuben, but to the house of Jacob, because all of this had taken place. And what made this act worse was, and a lot of times we, we wouldn't understand this in our day and time, but in, but in ancient culture, when a son tried to take his father's wife, it was an act of declaring that, he was now the head of the household. You remember later in history, um, Absalom took ten of the concubines of David um, in a public way to declare that he had taken over his father's place, not only in his household, but in the kingdom. Now, a lot of these things in the Old Testament, I just think they're so messed up. Uh, it, it, we, you, we do ourselves a lot of favor um, by uh, just being the husband of one wife, okay? Um, I think there's a reason the New Testament teaches that principle. And yet all of these things were true in that day and time. And so now Reuben, he's probably 20, 25 years old. He stands up to Jacob, and he's ready to take over the home. Like, like any uh, dumb young person who thinks they know it all, that's where, that's where Reuben's at. And what made the issue even worse, as we go down and read the genealogy, the Bible tells us who Bilhah was. Guess whose maid she was? Anybody know? Rachel. She was Rachel's maid. Well, what just happened to Rachel? She died. Well, what what a thoughtless act. What an incompassionate act. Jacob just lost his most beloved wife, and now here's Reuben doing this horrible thing with with, with a woman that was so, so closely connected with that wife that had just passed away. And, and from so many different angles, uh, it was so wrong what Reuben had done in this situation right here. And at this point, we find the Bible tells us that Jacob, he didn't do anything after he heard about what had taken place. I mean, we, we don't, the Bible doesn't tell us that. He, the Bible just tells us that he heard about it. He, he took no action at this point in time. But later on, towards the end of Genesis, we'll see that when it came time to pass on the inheritance, he talked to Reuben first, and he, he skipped over Reuben, and he, instead of giving Reuben a blessing, he gave him a curse. And he didn't give him any part of his inheritance. Didn't give, it, give, didn't give, him, give his children any part of his inheritance. Guess who the inheritance went to? It went to Joseph. Joseph. Why Joseph? Well, Reuben was a son that had brought him shame. Joseph was a son that had brought him honor. 
And so he passed on his inheritance to Joseph and not to Reuben at that juncture of his life. And so we see that later. But the Bible, it paints a very vivid picture for us here. And, and boy, we could turn to the book of Proverbs. And I think I listed several Proverbs in your notes here. The Bible is very vivid in how it communicates how much a child who grows up and, and lives apart from the way that God wants you to live, lives a sinful life, how much shame they bring upon their parents. The Bible says in Proverbs 19, 26, He that wastes his father and chases away his mother is a son that causes shame and brings reproach. Proverbs 28 and verse 7, it says, Whoso keepeth the law is a wise son, but he that is a companion of righteous man shameth his fathers. And I tell you, and I don't know this by experience, and I pray I never do know this by experience, but one of the most difficult things to handle as you walk down the path that God has called you to walk down, one of the most difficult things to handle is watching those you love and have taught the right way go down the path of sin and shame. That is not easy. And I'll tell you why I know it's not easy. Because I've walked down some of that road with some of you who have experienced this. And as I say, I pray I never experience this with my own, with my own children. But it's still a possibility. And boy, Jacob... He's experiencing this great revival in the midst of it. One of his own sons chooses to walk away and to live in such a way that is so against everything that they stood for as a family. And how difficult that must have been for them to go through at this point. I want you to keep something in mind. Jacob heard about it. Jacob wasn't happy about it. Jacob didn't bless his son later on because of it. But Jacob didn't disown his son. It is pride that will lead you to disown your children. Hey, we're all wayward sons and daughters to God sometimes. I'm glad God doesn't disown us. But don't miss this. I don't believe we should disown our kids. But at the same time, and I want to read this to make sure I say this right. Like Jacob, you ought not honor those who dishonor God. You are not helping your child by enabling them or by approving of their sinful lifestyle. There's a way you can not disown them but still show that you disapprove of the lifestyle that they've chosen. There is a way that can be done. It's tough love. And that's what Jacob began to show to Reuben at this point in time, I believe, in his lifetime. And we see evidences of that later in the history of Israel. But, hey, young people, teenagers, especially, you listen to me. I want all of our teens to look at me. Let me tell you something. One of the best ways that you can honor mom and dad is to grow up and live by the principles they've taught you to live by. One of the best ways you can honor them is to live for God, to do God's will for your life. And that ought to be a desire in every one of our hearts. The Bible says in Proverbs 23 and verse number 24, The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. And boy, thank God for kids who do stick with it, not perfectly, but do stick with it. And they bring, a, they bring a sense of joy to the life. My, and I know my kids are still young, but boy, I, 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 my, my head's like a thousand, a thousand times bigger because of this. But we were, we were in a youth group on Wednesday night. We are just talking to the kids about reading their Bibles every day, So, among many other things we talked about. And I challenged them to write down some spiritual goals that they had for the year. And, and I didn't find out about this till the next day, but Emily told me that when they got home, Hattie had written a list. And on her list, she, one of her goals is that she was going to read her Bible every day. And uh, lo and behold, the next day, uh, that next morning, she had her Bible out. And she read the first 12 ber verses of, well, she was reading in the book of Genesis where she started actually. And Emily said, well, maybe, maybe we shouldn't start in Genesis. And so she directed her to the book of John, a little easier to read. And uh, I think she's made it up to verse number 19 uh, in, in John chapter number 1 in the first three days here. And by the way, as a side note, if a six-year-old can do it, I think you can read your Bible too, okay? Well, the Bible's too hard for me to read. Well, try being six years old, Okay. Well, I have a third grade education. She has a first grade education, so there you go. Um, but uh, 
uh, you can do it. It's a matter of desire. But uh, there, there's that. And boy, that, but a child who just, just doesn't do it perfectly but just lives for the Lord, wants to do what's right, uh, bring, brings honor, brings joy to the parents. And with Jacob here, he faced a trial of shame. It wasn't easy to walk through. So there was a trial of sorrow. There was a trial of shame. But then the last thing I want you to notice this evening is that there was a trial. Uh, there were trials of separation. Trials of se- separation. Verse number 27 of Genesis 35, the Bible tells us, And Jacob came unto Isaac his father into Mamre, unto the city of Arba, which is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac sojourned. And the days of Isaac were in hundred and fourscore years, a hundred and eighty years he lived. And Isaac gave up the ghost and died, and was gathered unto his people, being old and full of days. And read the last phrase out loud with me. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Now, Jacob, I don't, it, it's at least 25, 30 years he's been away from home at this point. He finally makes it back to dad. He finally gets reunited with dad. That dad he had lied to, that dad he'd lived so many years away from wondering, is dad going to let me, is dad going to receive me back home? He finally got to go back to dad. And there he is. Now, the Bible doesn't say how long he was there. It could have been years. We don't know. But what we do know is not, not very long after the Bible indicates that Isaac passed away. And what happens here? Well, there was a child of a separation in Jacob's life. And for a young man that has had a good daddy, not a perfect daddy, and even, for, even for a man that hasn't had the greatest dad, losing your dad is a tough thing. It's a tough thing for a man. But here, once again, Jacob faced another trial. And he got separated from his father. When his father died, he inherited everything. Um, that happened because, remember, he tricked his brother out of the birthright and the blessing. And all that was there, but he lost his dad. And he faced here another trial. And, and once again, as we've seen earlier, God was continuing just to detach him from the things that were holding him to an attachment to this earth. He's getting a little bit more separated from the things of this world and a little bit more separated unto God. So it was a a separation from his father. But then look at verse number 1 of chapter 36. The Bible says, Now these are the generations of Esau, who was Edom. Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan. And it goes through and tells us what we've read about before, all these uh, pagan wives that Esau took. Esau was a worldly man. He lived for this world. He married worldly women, and they lived for this world. And uh, the Bible gives us that record very clearly here in the Scripture. But the Bible tells us, continue on in verse number 6. You guys there with me, verse number 6? The Bible says, And Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters and all the persons of his house and his cattle and all his beasts and all his substance, which he had gotten in the land of Canaan. And he went into the country from the face of his brother Jacob, for their riches were more than that they might dwell together, and the land wherein they were strangers could not bear them because of their cattle. Now Jacob gets separated from his brother. And, and at the first look, you think, that's a good thing. Well, they didn't get along very well when they were younger. But it wasn't as good as what you might think for Jacob from an earthly human perspective. Jacob had spent most of his life estranged from his brother, at odds with his brother. Remember, they had finally gotten things reconciled. They had finally embraced. They had finally decided to get along with each other. I'm sure in Jacob's mind, humanly speaking, he was thinking, now I get to finally have this relationship that I've never got to have with my brother. But then Isaac dies, and Esau says, we can't live here together. You're inheriting all this, and so I'm moving. And Esau moves over to Seir. He moves over to the kingdom, what will eventually become the kingdom of, of Edom. He takes the land away from King Seir and the people that were there before, and he, his descendants inhabit that land. Now Jacob is separated from his brother. So in a very literal sense, he has no more family. He has no more earthly family that he has any type of connection to or relationship to. The Bible tells us, the Bible doesn't tell us that he ever sees Esau again. I don't believe that he did. They never saw each other again. There's another separation that took place here. I tell you, people that aren't driven 
by God's purposes for their life. I'm not saying that it's wrong for you to live close to family. Sometimes that's the direction that God leads. But other times, God leads you to take a different route. I'm thinking of the Coralies who were here last Sunday night. They want to go and they want to spend their life in Nepal. Spending their life in Nepal means they're going to spend their life away from their earthly families. They're going to come back and visit every two to four years. That, that's not the human decision to make if you're wanting to be close to family. But sometimes going the direction God wants you to go means that you've got to be willing to say goodbye to some earthly relationships. And one of the true indicators of this revival that had taken place in Jacob's heart is that when God began to formulate these separations in his life, he didn't allow them to drive him back to being earthly driven. He allowed God to, to use these separations to draw him closer to God's purposes. And I like what one person wrote about this. He wrote this as an illustration. He says, when a man would ascend in a balloon, like a hot air balloon, he must throw out ballast. And the higher he would go, the more ballast he must cast away. And that is what is happening to Jacob in his life here. The things that weighed him down, that bound him to this earth, those things were being taken away from him. You know, oftentimes the trials we go through in life, the trials of sorrow, even the things that bring us shame in our life, the trials of separation, friendships we used to have, family members we used to be close to, a lot of times God allows those things to happen just to throw those weights out so that we can ascend a little bit higher, so that we can come to a greater place of maturity, a greater place of usefulness for God's kingdom and glory. And one of the results of revival we see in Jacob's life is the slow working of God of removing these weights out of his life, weights he probably didn't even know he had. And I want to encourage you tonight, don't despise the trials. You ought to embrace them. Instead of asking God, how can I get out of this? Or why am I going through this? Ask God what he wants you to learn through the trials that you're going through. Because God wants to use those things to give you less of a desire for this world and more of a desire for the things of eternity. And by God's grace, as we enter into this new year, I pray we'll enter into it with the spirit of revival. And yes, we'll face trials this year, but I pray that we'll face them with this faith instead of fear, with this courage instead of cowardice, with our affection set on heavenly things instead of it being set on earthly things. And by God's grace, may we do it. Now, this is the last thing I'll say to finish off chapter 36. The end of chapter 36, I'll not take the time to read it. It's a genealogy. It's a genealogy of uh, uh, Esau and the kingdom of Edom. And it's very interesting. I wish we had time to study it. We don't here tonight. But if you go through and study the descendants of, of the Edomites, um, they descended to a place uh, called Edom. And one of the most significant cities we know about in that, that nation is Petra. How many of you ever seen the rock fortress in Petra? It was once known as the, uh, in ancient history as one of the most impregnable fortresses in, in all of the world in its day. And uh, they were a very strong people. And some people say the reason it was called Edom, which means red, was because of those red rocks. Other people say it's because when Esau was born, he was red all over. I don't know which one it is. But it's very interesting studying the history of the Edomites. What's significant for us as Christians today is you look at the genealogy of Esau. And then you look at the genealogy of Jacob. And what's the difference? Well, Esau... He lived for this world. Jacob, he lived for eternity. Esau lived for what he could get today. Jacob lived for what God promised him tomorrow. And how did it turn out? Genesis 36 is the last time Esau shows up with any significance in the narrative of history. Last time. But we'll be hearing about Jacob for all of eternity. You tell me which one was more significant. And it brings us back to the same thing. Let's not live for this world. 
Let's live for God this year. Let's bow our head and close our eyes together. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. So much more could be said on these things. We're out of time tonight, but the application stands clear. God is calling you back to Bethel. Have you heard that call today, that call to revival in your heart? Maybe you've heard the call from God to come trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you don't know Christ, I pray you'll come during this invitation. Come, let us show you how you can know Jesus tonight. But for those of you that know Christ as your Savior, the first step in the rest of your life could begin today. If you'd be willing to take that first step back towards Bethel, that first step towards this revival that God's calling to in your heart. And yes, you begin to experience this revival, you'll still go through difficulties, but the way you handle them will be transformed if you are going the direction that God is wanting you to go. And tonight, you may be going through some of those trials, and you may, to, you may have needed to hear these words of encouragement to give you courage and faith to face those trials the way God wants you to. And tonight, I want to give you an opportunity to come talk to the Lord about that at an altar. And so how many of you would say tonight, Pastor, as, I, as we've heard the preaching today, I can be honest that God has spoken to my heart in some way. And I just want to ask you to pray for me because God has spoken to me today and there's some things I, I, I need prayer about as I think about these things. If that's you, would you lift your hand? God has spoken to me today. Would you please pray for me? Uh, many hands. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a time of invitation. I don't want to invite you to come talk to the Lord. Come as a family. Come as an individual. But come talk to the Lord about what he's spoken to your heart. And if you need to come trust Jesus as your Savior, I'm going to stand right here at the front. I want you to come to me. I want to help you. I'd love to show you how you can know Christ as your Savior tonight. And I hope you'll come if God's speaking to your heart about that. Let's stand together with our heads bowed and eyes closed. And right now as the music begins to play, why don't you step out and come, Christian. God's spoken to your heart. You lifted a hand. Why don't you lift your heart to the Lord during this invitation this evening. Aziz continue to pray. Why don't we sing that song, Turn Your Eyes. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strange.
life together. Father, we come before you and we thank you for this time that we've been able to spend uh, in your word. Lord, I pray that uh, as we conclude this time, you help us to go from this place. And I pray that you would uh, help us, Lord, to be able to apply the truths that we have um, learned today. Uh, more importantly, to put to practice the decisions that you put in our hearts to make. And uh, Lord, I pray for a true revival in our church family. Uh, we'd turn from our own ways and turn back to you. 